with over 25 years of global engineering experience across America, Middle East, and India, and now more Indian than Spanish, the head of structural engineering at KPM, and the currently based Mumbai is Napoleon de la Colina. Napoleon, a master in civil engineering with more than 25 years of experience and 162 successful projects, is a specialist in earthquake resistance structure and seismic retrofitting. With his Spanish root and global experience, Napoleon brings a wealth of engineering expertise and design practice from around the globe to KPM and has credited accredited head of our head of KPM structural engineering practice. I welcome Napoleon and I hand over the mic to him for further presentation. Thank you, Gosema. Thank, Thank you. So, good afternoon. I really have a very diverse uh, auditorium. I really would like to know uh, how many of you are in the trade of engineering or I want to conduct a poll, really. Are you an architect? How many of you are architects? Oh, that's great. <laughs> How many of you are engineers? Any of you business developers? Or students? Contractors? Fine. Just to have an idea to what level we can we can connect all, all, the, all the ends of this presentation, which is very short. Just the first, first idea I want to explain is the uh, wind is the driving force of uh, building design. When we talk about 40 stories and above, as Martin Dulcar mentioned a while ago, uh, the size and the geometry of the 1973 towers were driven by wind design. Once you cross the 120 meters layer, you have to control wind, and wind becomes more critical than earthquake forces. So it's also good to know what nature of wind phenomenon we have in our locality. If we are talking Bombay or we are talking Calcutta, it's a bit different. So the phenomenon of wind here also, how it is measured. It happened in the airport of Baki in Azerbaijan. They upgraded the measuring uh, devices and now they have forces that are double of what they used to have. It's good to know all that information because wind is a, is a, statistic, is a statistic information. Wind is not something that all the time will come as a steel grade comes 500 MPA or the concrete grade M30, M60. Wind will come as it comes. And the peaks are a matter of statistics. The second uh, aspect that relates to wind that will control your building ultimately, your high rise, is how the building responds to wind. So if, if, if you have a very thin building, like this sheet of paper, and I blow through it, you may see the, the paper lift taking off. I, I need to blow harder. But actually, the paper takes off. It's like a wing of a plane. So there are suction forces that lift the paper up. So when the building is too slim, and that is a second case we are talking of, vortex shading. When the building is too slim, the building starts shaking across the wind. And you may have deflections across the wind that are higher along the wind. So across a wind effect can be more dangerous, especially in slender structures that are one side, one side very thin and the other side quite wide. What happens? The building, when shaking, starts 
sharing uh, eddies, small vortex, these vortices create suction in an uneven manner. And while shaking, the building shakes unpredictably. In any case, these things come out when you do a wind tunnel test. There are databases like the NAT has in the US and some other databases in UK that provide information of thousands of buildings done in the past. So you can anticipate those phenomena before you finalize your concept. And this is very important to tackle early. And finally, the third aspect to, to take care of before starting a building is the occupancy comfort. Again, this can be anticipated at concept stage. So the criteria is quite diverse. This is what WinTech approaches as in general. There is consensus in most of the researchers that 15 thousands of gravity, that is 15 by thousand divided by thousand of gravity, the 15 milli-g is the threshold for comfort occupancy for residential buildings. Whereas for office buildings in which you are more active than passive, it's about 2025. So in that consensus, when you cross that threshold, then you have a problem. And this can be anticipated early enough. What has happened in the past, I'll be quick, I think, on this point. What has happened in the past, especially in the American codes, which are the leading codes, especially ASC 7, the changes have been one after another. So ASCE, from the mile uh, approach, has changed to the three second gust, and after that, Everything started happening, 95, 98, revision 2002, revision 2005. So after 2005, they say, enough. We start stabilizing all this, and we'll review only every five years. But one important, very important aspect was tackled in that code of 2005, which is the effect of torsion in the building due to wind. We are used to see torsion due to earthquake, but due to wind, the case four, when you have a, a first approach by code without wind tunnel, you can detect that the code gives a lot of importance to the torsion of the building. Torsion not to the geometry, but to the suction and pressures on the sides of the structure. So the building starts twisting due to wind. Even if the geometry is quite, we got lost. Even if the geometry is quite uh, regular, Yeah, so now we'll get more practical, and I think you, you'll start following more, more easily these points. Uh, what is happening? As we start growing tall, we can imagine we have a chimney. The chimney doesn't need any support. If you go taller because of demands of the industry, you may have a guide chimney where you have tiebacks or stays, like the red lines in the picture. But that has a disadvantage. You are covering more area, you need more space. You are blocking your space also. But you are solving your problem, you can go high. When you go to the next stage, you can say, okay, instead of putting those elements, I can put my structure very stiff, very thick, and you can see those chimneys that were steel, now they become concrete or in some old structures, brick. So that chimney becomes very solid, very bulky, and less spacious inside. You can still think of a building like that. And in fact, that's way, the way we go. We start putting more shear walls, more shear walls, more shear walls, and there's a moment in which the density of shear walls cannot be done anymore. So what is next? Demand is to go higher. What to do? So 
wind engineering has its things. So even as chimneys have a very specific guidance from codes in which at the top one third of the height, you put spiral deflectors. So the wind gets twisted down. So whatever was going to be a suction force or a pressure ahead, it becomes, on the contrary, a force downwards and makes the building more stable rather than more shaky. So all this summarizes the presentation of today. If you have this picture in mind, this will be the beginning and the end. It's not that I'm going to show the picture again. <laughs> Just keep it in mind. I won't show it again. But this is how we are going to evolve. <clears throat> it is one point important, uh, maybe for engineers to know, that the building and the wind loading should remain elastic. It's not like the earthquake. In the earthquakes, you cut the force by one third, one fourth, one fifth. And then with that forces, you design. And you assume that there will be dissipation through ductility. No? This doesn't happen in, in wind. You have to work on elastic range. The structural damping values means any structure you put to vibrate after some time stops. Why? Because it's inherent to the structure. So when you have a tall building, that happens very late. In an RC structure, maybe 5% for a seismic force. For a wind force, it will be 2%. But if a tall building, you may reach 1%. And in some cases, even less than 1%. So there are parameters and there are institutions that measure the actual result of buildings as they perform. So we get feedback of existing buildings. More serviceability concerns I already told you. Acceleration and overall deflection on the top floor. So the Indian standards establish that height by 500 is the limit. AAC standard established that 1 by 500 is okay as a minimum limit, or 1 to 600. Dubai has said also, like India, 1 to 500, finished. So that is how we go. What happens now when we want to make these structures more stable? The heavier, the better. It's unlike seismic. Seismic structures, if they are more heavy, they have attract more inertial forces. So when they shake in one direction, then bringing it back takes its toll on the structure, where pushing a structure that is heavy is more difficult. So keep in mind these reflections for what we are going to see. Now, we are just going to walk through a few buildings in which I have been involved, and one in which I'm very close to the designer. And I can showcase the extreme, like a, this is almost a record for the footprint achieved. So normally and naturally, we increase the number of shear walls. And that is the case of our Calcutta One. It's a tower owned by Tata Housing in Alipur, Calcutta, where the seismic conditions are tough, where high seismicity, where the wind conditions are tougher than Bombay also. 50 meters per second. That's about 180 kilometers per hour, and near 110 miles per hour, which is quite high. So everything happens there, it's like multi-hazard zone. So if you see, let us look at what is more attractive. That red color is showing the density of shear walls. Practically all the possible partitions have been made into shear wall. This is what I was saying about the chimney. If the lateral stability is provided by the shear wall system, there is a moment in which you cannot put any more shear walls. But anyway, this building performs beautifully. And you can see in yellow uh, the masses, how they translate and they rotate in an orderly manner. <coughs> Wind deflections checks, seismic drift check, that is the interstory drift. Those are checked for serviceability. The windows on 10 years return period and on 20 years return period 
for the drift control. There is another case, something happened. There is another case. Uh, yeah, this is a, a, another tower in Bombay, in Oshiwara. Uh, this tower is 140 meters, 142, I think. So has that layout. You can see the red, dark red uh, elements. Again, display the density of partitions. The blue elements are likely beams. So there we cannot put more shear walls, maybe a little more, but no more. Why? Because they are putting car parkings in between the bays. Putting three car parkings here, one and one and two and three more. So that, that is showing the limitation of the structure. We cannot put more lateral rigidity through shear walls. So what happens when we start doing the first analysis? These dotted lines you see, these dotted lines are not a part of the original design. The dotted lines were added later. So imagine, imagine that those lines are, do not exist. The building was displaying a lot of torsion. That means when the lateral load comes, the wind or the earthquake, the building was twisting over and above everything. 68%, sorry, 69% of its mass was rotating, practically the entire building. And translational will be only in the second mode of vibration. Those are the time periods in which we had. And we are moving also very, very complex uh, structure in terms of dynamics. So there was a very simple solution. Uh, those red dotted lines became a, like a vertical truss. So the vertical truss is connecting those two large shear walls you have on the flanks. And that stabilizes and brings back order. What happened? We don't have any lateral element on the facades. Nobody wants it. But those elements were in the center. So any eccentricity will make it shake and twist. So those elements came into the picture, as you can see. See the vertical, like a stitch. But those are 600 by 600 beams and, and, uh, and braces. Again, before and after, it, displacements were kind of more organized and orderly. Yeah. This is easy to understand. Don't think that these are complicated things. We can imagine that we have a building like a pendulum. The same as we can have a structure with several floors above. Every floor represented by one circle, dark circle. The entire building can be represented by a single vertical element with equivalent stiffness and all the mass in that point. Having that, when we apply lateral force, whether it is earthquake or whether it is wind, the building have a movement which responds to the first equation. X double dash is the acceleration. Mass multiplied by acceleration will give you force. C X dash is the velocity multiplied by the damping. Any structure has inherent damping. Any structure after shaking for a while stops shaking. So any structure has damping. And then X displacement. When you pull a spring, it comes back. And that all is equivalent to the acting force. Very well. So that is the definition of all structural analysis always. So what happens when we put an element, there's a spring, you push, it will react as much. So when you have a normal shaking of the building, what you have on the dotted line extreme, maximum deformation. But at that moment, the velocity is zero. When it comes to the center, at that moment, you have maximum velocity, but the formation is zero. So there are some devices that take advantage of that. And you don't have to add more structural elements. They are called dampers. And you can put them in 
the value of C. So they work out of phase. A damper is like when you have a door and there's a spring and you want to close the door and the, the arm holding it doesn't allow you to slam the door. But if you close it gently, you can close it. You put less velocity, you close it. You push it hard and want high speed, it will bounce back. The same thing happens with dampers. So the structure is more efficient because you don't use a steel and a concrete. You use a damping. So this is one approach more called dissipation approach. So instead of making bulkier and bulkier the structure, we can put some elements to dissipate that energy and let go when it can be let go. When you can let go in the maximum extreme of displacement, no, because it will fall. You will let go when it is in the neutral point, but it's a maximum velocity. Okay, so these are like, like a shock absorber or your motorbike, same thing. When you talk about this viscous fluid dampers, they have a property that they are not affected by temperature. They don't need any maintenance. And it will act, as I told you, in the moment in which the structure is not working, these elements will work. So your structure is less stressed. But there are some disadvantages also. This is in uh, Shanghai, the University of Tianjin. They decided to put dampers. But the architect has to think of it. Where? Otherwise, you just put a nice flower pot and cover the damper. That's a solution also. Everybody can solve the problem that way. But not always is a nice solution. So this has to be well thought of and planned in advance. So this is another part. I believe here is more acceptable being a steel and glass building. You can accept a damper. So what happens? This A brace, chevron brace, is bringing the deformations of the floor to the top. And in contrast with the next floor, there is a relative movement. Given that relative movement will be absorbed by the damper. So the damper has a stroke. I really don't know how we are of time now, because that thing stopped working. <laughs> okay, let's move on to another real case. So this is another, you can see the density of rear walls in this building. You cannot put one more. Maybe yes, but I mean, you don't have space for living. That building was 207.5 meters tall. It was not only that, this width was 21 meters, the length was 34.5. So in that 21 meters, 207, you can make quick numbers. That is about 1 is to 9. It's quite a lot. So this building was shedding vortex. This building was shaking when the wind was coming on the long direction. The building was shaking more on the north-south direction, up and down. So the flexion were beyond any limit of 1 is to 500. Not acceptable. It was not possible to build that height with this configuration. This is one of the buildings of Vivek Bolle. Then, uh, unfortunately, it got truncated due to changes in municipal rules. But a study was done. So one interesting approach was here, in which architecture will, will not be affected too much the cutout approach. With a cutout approach, you can hide it within the core wall, you can allow for the displacement, you can put a 20, minute, 20 mm gap and absorb the rest of the differential of the movement within the wall. How is before and after? Before you can see x, x across wind, it was more uncomparable to y, y a long wind, 0.53, 0 0.54. Well, after putting the dampers, it drops down to a more normal. That means the building starts twisting. And this is the demand of 
elements that was put there. These are what these instruments look like. They have several manufacturers. Even in India, we have suppliers. Again, accelerations were measured on peak 10 minute, 10 minute, 10 year uh, serviceability return period. And we were having 10.6 millis for a residential is quite comfortable. There is another alternative, the toggle brace, which is extremely effective, but you won't put it maybe on a building, you will put it rather in a factory or in a park, a car park on some other structure. It is too gross, unless you can conceal it somewhere else. One more approach. Uh, there's another building, uh, but this building is much taller. It is 318 in Jacob's Circle. So the profile is there. I mean, it's very long, very tall, and has a different problem. In any case, again, the density of shear walls is already coped. There is no more you can put. And if you put more, you start encroaching in the saleable area. So there are beams, beams connecting each of the shear walls. And these link, beams are called link beams. The link beams, when they connect two shear walls, they give great stability. But what happens? Uh, the designer had uh, gone beyond and had not checked. And all those link beams were failing. So when we have checked everything, the OS, OS means overstressed. Through the height, I mean, I had to zoom because it is impossible to see that small. It is too long, too tall building. So all the beams were overstressed, but absolutely all. So what control you can have of the lateral stability of the building if all your beams have failed? So what we did, we deleted all those beams and ran again the model. And with that, we worked. But then your displacements increase. So now there are some devices, modern devices, which can do the job of a link beam. And you can hide it there. You can see the, the lintel. So we can put one or two link beams in the lintel and dissipate the energy. So what are those link beams? Again, are those dissipation elements that have several plates of steel, like a sandwich. One plate of steel, one plate of viscoelastic material, a, a kind of rubber material, and another plate of steel and another plate of rubber. And that is elastromagnetic material. It has control stiffness. So the specifications are similar to the viscous fluid dampers, but are, are slightly less efficient. Viscous fluid dampers are extremely the most efficient way of, of controlling movement. The rockets, when they were shooting rockets from a ship, if you shoot a very heavy rocket, the, the ship can overturn. So you need a damping system. So that was used in, uh, in ballistics. And only after some years, it was released for the, uh, for the public in the US. The US Army had invented that, the US Navy. So the dampers come from that. Now we have alternative solutions. And this is also a fantastic solution. It was done in Manila, Philippines, in Ayala Tower. And we have proposed it also for Jacob Circle structure. This is how they look. The sandwich, the viscoelastic polymer, the piece of rubber, you can call it. The steel plates, bolted. And this is a test. <coughs> Nowadays, it is very frequent. We are doing several buildings in which we are putting embedded steel beams into the shear walls. In many cases, also, we have seen that the consultants put steel plates wrapped in concrete. Those steel plates are actually 100% taking the entire shear. So if we are taking the entire shear by steel plates, then there's no need of wrapping it in concrete. Better put an element that can dissipate that energy. And you save a little more in steel and concrete. Obviously, we have to spend money into this. And there comes the cost balance. <coughs> Fine. And this is the last slide. <coughs> this is, uh, remember, the chimney with a spiral? This is equivalent to that, the smart building. <coughs> it's a building with a diagrid. 
I think rarely architects will accept uh, a diagrid building for residential. This is a commercial building in Dubai, <coughs> done by Sean Killa. He's an engineer and architect. Of course, working as architect now. So he was given a structure, <coughs> as you see it there, without these blue columns on the periphery. He was given that blue square in the center, which is a core. That core had outside very heavy columns. Instead of those two that you see around, it had bulky columns that were penetrating into the sellable area. So there was practically nothing left for occupancy. And it was extremely heavy and expensive. And not only that, the designer had proposed on top of that a tune mass damper, like the one we have in Taipei, that big pendulum that looks very, very fancy, but takes a lot of money, $60 million just for that pendulum. And you have to take 80 tons on top of that height. Yeah, it's something you can visit as something, a curiosity. But if you are selling that space, you better invest that money. So he was given this challenge, and he thought of a diagrid that fulfilled two, op two functions. Dissipating the wind, like in the spiral chimney, and at the same time helping us support and taking most of the gravity loads outside the periphery. I don't say the gravity loads, I mean the lateral resisting system. The farther they are, the more they perform. <coughs> so the core was in the center still, the same size of core, but the columns were on the periphery. And this became very, very effective. Okay, I've finished. We have gone from the basic chimney to the most efficient chimney. This is cost effective, super tall because it's 31 meters by 31 footprint and 470 meters. Make numbers. One to 15. We're struggling with one is to nine of the Potar Tower. He has one is to 15. Okay, that's all. This is how it looks. <coughs> Uh, yeah, what I was trying to say, uh, this shape will create those eddies that will bring down the force and will avoid that suction that would happen otherwise if the wind goes straight past the tower. So the lateral movement decreases. At every floor is different because at every floor you have a different position of the vertical columns and inclined columns. Then on top he put these fancy generators also to take some space and avoid some extra, extra building uh, uh, fascia for the, for the wind. Anyway, this was the conclusion of, of my talk. Thank you. If you want to ask